Hi everyone. On my last project, I started doing JavaScript a bit differently, and I thought I'd try a screencast to introduce it. It starts with a new package manager for front-end JavaScript code called JSPM. It's a project with a long history, but has changed significantly in the last 12 months, and I feel like it's really ready to start using. How I'd like to show it is by building something small, um, but something that has dependencies and makes use of a few of the new ES6 features. If you're not familiar, ES6 is the next version of JavaScript, which isn't quite finalized yet, but has stabilized enough uh, to start using seriously. I'm going to build something that scrapes the GIFs from a subreddit called Perfect Loops. It's full of interesting GIFs like this one that have been painstakingly edited so that they loop perfectly. And I thought it'd be fun to put a bunch of them on the page at once. The first step is to install the JSPM CLI. I'm going to install it globally using dash G so it's available everywhere in my system. JSPM is designed as a replacement for using NPM when doing front-end projects, but it still pulls packages from NPM and from GitHub, so all the same code that you might have been using from NPM or from Bower is immediately available to you. I think that's a really smart separation of concerns. Incidentally, it's one that the NPM organization have uh, endorsed. Um, so I'll show a little bit about how JSPM chooses to do that. Okay, I'm going to get started by running JSPM init. You can configure things here, but the defaults are okay for us for now. You'll notice it's downloading a couple of dependencies straight off the bat. These are Tracer, which is Google's ES6 compiler, ES6 module loader, which handles the on-the-fly compilation, and System.js, which does all the dynamic dependency loading. JSPM has created a couple of files for us, as well as a JSPM packages directory for the dependencies. We'll go more into that in a sec. I'm going to start by writing a very simple HTML page. And let's start a server to see this in the browser. I'm going to use a little tool here called Live Server. It's a simple command line, zero configuration web server, just serves the files in the directory and refreshes the browser when anything changes. It's not doing any compilation or anything, which is why it always works and I use it all the time. So let's just confirm that Live Reload is working. Good. Okay, so onto JavaScript. We start by including system.js from its subdirectory. That creates an object called system, which is actually part of the ES6 module spec, but this is, of course, a shim. We can use it to load our own source files, like so. And if we write a console log, we can see that it's being executed. On the network tab, you can see that it's loading system.js, which is then fetching ES6 module loader, and then our source file. Now, at the moment, the loader sees our source file as simply ES5 and doesn't have to compile it. But if we change that to be ES6, we can see that now Tracer is being loaded and our file is being compiled. So we can start using ES6 syntax. ES6 changes a lot about writing JavaScript. In particular, there's now a proper way to define and include modules, so let's start with one. Let's give our object a name, a Reddit API, and create a file for it to live. I really like using ES6 classes at the moment, and using export default new is a nice way to keep using classes, but expose a singleton to the rest of your app. So if we invoke the load method here, we can see our console output. Note the file name and line number. System.js is loading each file individually and compiling with source maps. So if we need to inspect or debug anything, we can work with our source files directly. So in development, we really don't care that there's a compilation stage. But now it's time to actually start pulling some data from Reddit. Reddit's read API is dead simple. You've just added .json to the end of the URL. This doesn't have any cause headers, though, so we can't access it directly from our code. But they do provide a JSONP version just by adding a query string. So that's what we'll use. As always, somebody's made a super simple JSONP wrapper on NPM that does this and nothing else, which we're going to grab. And this is where JSPM is really great. The first thing we have to do is add the config.js to our HTML file. This is how JSPM, the command line, communicates with system.js, the loader. You can think of config.js as being a manifest for all of your dependencies that the browser understands. So to install something from npm, we can do this on the command line, and then we can immediately start using it. You can see that we're loading JSONP, and actually, we're loading all of its dependencies individually. 
It's not using a distribution file like Bower or a pre-compilation step like browser file Webpack. Each individual file is being fetched and executed, which is exactly how Node.js or any server-side language would be working. But this is happening from the browser uh, through the network to your file system. This is a great workflow for development. We'll talk about production in a minute. OK, we've pulled in our dependency. Let's use it to grab some data. We'll make use of our constructor to store the base URL, then we'll call JSONP and output the results. Notice how an ES6 array function here makes things look a little cleaner. And we're getting data, great. Now we need to extract the URLs of the GIFs, and we could do that here, but it doesn't feel like this is this class's responsibility. And because we've got ES6, it's pretty easy to extract that into a new file. So let's just grab the posts from here and return them. Now this is an async operation, but ES6 has native promises, so let's use one of those. And then if we log out the results, we can see we've got the data. Now let's write something to extract the GIFs. I'm going to call it extract GIFs, and I'm going to invoke it directly after the load here. I'm going to export a simple function here rather than a class. Um, because this is really only doing one thing. The first thing I want to do is I want to map the posts and extract the URLs, and we should see that data coming out. Perfect. The first thing I want to do is I want to filter out anything that might not be appropriate for this demo. Um, Reddit gives us a nice flag whether something's not safe for work, so let's just get rid of any of those results. Then I want to filter the results to make sure that I'm only getting uh, URLs that actually end in GIF. Now, Reddit has a slight curiosity here, which is that some of the GIFs are actually GIF Vs, which is Imgur's video GIF conversion format. So I'm just going to match them as well and then get rid of the V, and that will return me the, um, the actual GIF. OK, the last step is to get these GIFs on the page somehow. I'm going to create another file called display GIFs, and much the same, it's going to be a simple function. It's going to grab the element off the page with the ID of GIFs, and we'll just set it in a HTML to be a bunch of image tags. Note that we're using the backtick syntax here to build up a string template. And there we have it. We have GIFs. They take a little while to load, but they're all on the page. Now, they don't look all that good, so let's just apply a little bit of CSS to clean them up. The first thing I want to do is remove the margin on the body, and then for each image, I want them to take up a quarter of the screen. So I can do that by making them block level and floating them to the left, and then making them half the width of the viewport and half the height of the viewport. Uh, that looks great, but if you change the aspect ratio of the viewport, you stretch the GIFs. So let's use a new CSS property called Object Fit to uh, solve that problem. Object Fit is only available in Chrome and upcoming versions of Firefox, but this is just a tech demo, so we can live with it. And this is great. We've written three modules, used a bunch of ES6 features like classes and template strings, pulled in a dependency from NPM, and done it all without needing to worry about how everything's getting compiled. I really like this workflow because it feels no more complex than writing old ES5, but you have all these new features and all this existing code from NPM to take advantage of. But production's a different matter. In this little demo, we're making 19 separate requests for JavaScript files, including the trace or compiler, which is about 500k. So obviously, we need to do something different in production. JSPM gives you a couple of ways to do production releases, but the simplest way I've found is to bundle everything together into a single file. The SFX here stands for self-executing. This removes everything dynamic and compiles everything into a single file. So you can replace the script tags in your HTML with a single production file. The one little gotcha is that JSPM doesn't bundle the trace or runtime. 
Actually, in future, it'll be possible to use an ESX compiler that has no runtime dependencies, but for now, you can simply add the trace your runtime and you're good to go. It'd be trivial to script up a gulp task to swap in this production script tag during a deploy, but I think I've talked long enough. I hope this has convinced you that ES6 and JSPM are a big step forward and that 2015 is the right time to be using them. I'd love feedback, so please get in touch. Thank you.